like to take this opportunity to wel welcome everybody back from the break. Um, we're about to start the uh, next session, which will be on uh, space tech opportunities. Uh, I'm Brenda Clyde, your moderator for this session. Um, I would, what we're going to do is give each of the panel members a few minutes to provide an overview of the opportunities uh, in their area, uh, and then we will take have a question and answer session at the end. So the objective of this uh, discussion is for the panel members to familiarize the community with different types of uh, space tech funding opportunities, and then to also give the audience the opportunity to hear more about what makes winning proposals for these different opportunities. Um, I'd like to start off uh, by introducing our first panelist, uh, Dr. Gareth Marion Griffith, who is the head of the Luster Solicitations for STMD. He comes to STMD from JPL, where he served as the mobility lead for Curiosity, so he comes with a, a, a big interest in the technology needed for the moon and other planets. Dr. Griffith, when you're ready. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can. And you want me to share my screen? Yes. Go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, okay. One second here. Okay. Let me know when you can see the content on the screen. Uh, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for inviting me to, to talk here. It's been a really interesting discussion uh, throughout the day. Uh, and that follows on from some of the, uh, the uh, focus group meetings that I've actually been attending uh, throughout the year. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a, an overview of uh, Space Tech uh, Research Grants. That's the program office that I work for, and it's the one that the Luster solicitation comes out of. Uh, so Space Tech Research Grants uh, actually has uh, five uh, different solicitations that we release uh, mostly each year with the exception. reconnect Dr. Griffith. Uh, in the meantime, we can go ahead and uh, start with uh, our next panelist, which is Dr. L.K. Kubendran. Am I back? Uh, he I'm is up your back. Okay. I think so. I can either wait till the end or, or continue. Uh, maybe I wait to the end and I use the dial in to make sure I can at least be heard. Okay. So we'll, we'll switch to uh, Dr. Bendrin, who is currently leading STMD's flagship partnership program and the tipping point solicitations. So Dr. Bendrin, whenever you're ready. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Next slide, please. Okay, tipping point uh, in a nutshell uh, is really co-investment of, uh, uh, of basically technology development leading to commercial capability. That's, uh, that's really what we are after. Uh, the idea is uh, once the technology is developed, you should have both commercial impact as, as well as NASA impact. Before. That's really how we look at the technologies that come into the program. Um, essentially, what, what, why we call it a tipping point? What we're saying is the, the core investment that we are making into either a ground demo or a flight demo, it should result in significant advancement of the technology, okay? And hopefully that it could also go to the market uh, from a commercial perspective. And we also expect to see investment made by the company either through their own funds or through uh, other uh, customers' funds, okay, before essentially that's what we look for. Of course, more than anything else, we also uh, require that the technology be at a TRL of at least four at the time of submitting a proposal. Next chart, please. Yeah, tipping point is actually not a program. It's an opportunity that uh, cuts across the directorate uh, and uh, across four different programs. Uh, I think the ones you are familiar with uh, are the GCD and the TDM perhaps, and then of course you also have flight opportunities, small spacecraft technology. Well, these are the four higher TR programs that actually, once we make the 
selection be allocated to these various programs uh, appropriately. The, only, the requirement we have is that these uh, proposals would come only from US for-profit entity. That, that's a uh, need. Uh, once we make the awards, that this will be like a firm fixed price uh, contract. One requirement, one, one important requirement is the industry has to co-invest. Uh, we're saying for large businesses, it should be at least 25%. And for smaller businesses, when we define small as uh, companies with less than 500 or less employees, that's how we do it. Um, let's go to the next chart, just to kind of give you a flavor for what we did last round. Okay, these are the ones that we actually made select selection in last year, October. As you can see, we used three different topics, uh, one on cryophilic, cryophilic, uh, cryogenic fluid management technology demonstration, the second one is probably more interesting to you, the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative Technology Demonstration, where we actually awarded uh, 10 uh, uh, proposals in various different uh, subtopics under LSII. Okay. For the total value, as you can see at the bottom, it's like $370 million, and a, uh, a decent chunk of it actually went to LSII. Um, in addition to... Uh, Tipping point, we also have another opportunity called ACO. Next chart, please. Okay. ACO is uh, for, for technologies that are not at TRL 4 yet. I think if it is, uh, let's say you have a minimum TRL 3 and you are trying to develop this commercial technology, you need some help from the government uh, in the form of using facilities and maybe perhaps uh, expertise from. Uh, uh, subject matter experts at NASA, or maybe use, using the hardware or software at NASA to accelerate the development of your technology. Okay, this is something uh, we do it, uh, we try to do it every year, uh, where you can collaborate with NASA centers to provide a proposal. If you select it, uh, you get a space act agreement and, uh, and in-kind support from the NASA centers. Okay, before we look at both tipping point and ACO as uh, like a, uh, sister, sister solicitations, and then this really far is a, is a nucleus of our uh, commercial strategy. Next chart, please. Okay, this kind of gives you a quick uh, overview of uh, what we selected in the last round. As you can see, there are a number of LSII related uh, uh, topics we had uh, asked for, and uh, a, a good number of our companies, like both small and large, have been selected in the last round. Okay, like that's Probably a good summary, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapendran. Um, I want to remind everybody to please put questions in the Q&A panel uh, so that we can uh, have discussions uh, at the end of these talks. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Jason Derleth, uh, he is currently the uh, program executive for the NIAC program at NASA. Uh, Mr. Derleth, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce NIAC to this crowd, a bunch of really interesting and innovative thinkers. So hopefully you can learn about the program and how to apply. Uh, so what is NIAC? We are the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program meant for early stage concepts uh, for NASA missions 10 or 20 or even more years out from eventual implementation in space. High risk, but high reward and open to any discipline. So you don't have to wait for your particular discipline to be a focus area uh, for the program. Uh, now we are far out. And so some things look a little bit um, I'm not going to say crazy because we really do our research. Uh, they're all technically credible. They can look like far out concepts because they are far out concepts. So what we're trying to do really is to change what's possible in aerospace for the future. So it's a really uh, uh, inspiring program and hopefully you can be a part of it. Uh, next slide, please. So we have three phases of study. Uh, the phase one opens in June. So this is great timing. We'll be opening, I think this year on June 2nd, although of course everything can change until the actual release happens. So please keep updated on the website. We do all of our solicitations through Inspires. 
Um, the first phase is 125K for nine months. We're looking at upgrading that to, I think, $175,000, though talks aren't done on there. So take a look at the solicitation to find out what it actually is. But last year, it was $125,000 for nine months of study. And interestingly, because we are open to all disciplines, we do have a little bit of a um, extra requirement for proposers. We ask people to take their technology development and put it into a mission context, something, uh, a demonstration of how effective that technology would be at actually doing something. So uh, don't just propose an in-space thruster. We don't know whether or not that in-space thruster would actually help unless you pick a particular target to go to that illustrates the benefits of that in-space thruster, just pulling something out randomly. and. Uh, show us through the mission analysis some mission level figures of merit that might change if your technology is fully successful. Uh, for those folks who do a, a successful phase one uh, uh, study, we have a phase two solicitation, which last year was in December. We're working on bringing that back to October. And then the phase three for successful phase twos, again, we're trying to pull that back to October. Uh, it takes a while to turn the mini battleship of, of uh, a small, even a small program. It does take years to move the schedule around. So we're trying to align it better for uh, use of internal resources as well as lining up with the educational uh, year as well, because we, we do take proposers and we have winners from education and from small business and other industry. And we also have NASA civil servants competing for these awards. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what are some NIAC lunar studies that have happened in the past to give you some idea? You see up uh, in the top, Ronald Pollard and Farview, that's a distributed radio antenna where all of the, uh, the vehicles that carry the radio antenna are, and the power are in situ resource utilization uh, uh, built. So the idea is that you would build more of these and more of these over time utilizing the, the regolith of the moon to build up to maybe a 20 by 20 kilometer array. Uh, in the upper right, uh, Patrick McGarry pedals. That is a uh, lunar sounder going down into the soil through the use of uh, an unrolling shape memory alloy antenna. Uh, Red Whitaker, of course, uh, is famous to, to a lot of folks uh, for his work um, at CMU as well as uh, Astrobotic proposed a, a, an autonomous rover to circumnavigate a pit and do three-dimensional imaging of that uh, all autonomously. Uh, Matthew Kuhn's uh, an instant landing pad, basically inject metal into the exhaust plume of a rocket as you're landing and you might be able to strengthen the regolith to withstand the, the landing uh, better and have less ejecta. Uh, Aquafactorum attempting to separate the grains of ice, which are as hard as rock at permanently shadowed crater uh, temperatures. So they might be able to be mechanically separated, assuming that they've been pulverized by incoming asteroids. Uh, Septarshi Bandiopati, uh, forgive me if I got your name wrong, Septarshi, uh, with the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, uh, an idea that's been bandied about for many, many years. But uh, Septarshi seems to have found a way of suspending a, a parabolic reflector in a crater that might actually work really well. So we're looking forward to seeing that continue on. And Joel Sircell with his lunar pro, uh, uh, propellant mining outpost, lunar polar mining outpost, I think, where you actually plan to put an astronaut habitat in a permanently shadowed crater, which on the face of it sounds crazy when you first hear it, but it turns out it is easier to thermally uh, uh, insulate and heat humans at the bottom of the crater than it is to get up and down and up and down and up and down when you're mining the outpost, uh, mining the regolith from the outpost or mining the water from the outpost. And so it might actually make more sense to put humans down in the bottom and reflect sunlight down to them to power the base. Uh, those are some examples. I can't wait to see what you all have uh, for our proposals this year. So please feel free to contact us. Our information is on the web, uh, nasa.gov forward slash NIAC. You can contact us, run ideas by us until the solicitation is open. And then I think it's the 14th, it'll be in the, in the solicitation of June. Uh, the 14th of June, we will have a, uh, a proposer's 
forum where you can come in and ask questions of us and hear hear about how to propose as well. So, uh, and that'll the, if the date changes, that'll be in the solicitation. So thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Durliff. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Amy Kaminsky. Uh, she's currently serving as the program executive for prizes, challenges, and crowdsourcing. She's working to develop strategies that expand involvement of citizens in NASA's research activities. Dr. Kaminsky, whenever you're ready. Yes, I am. I am here. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I, I don't know that my video is working. I don't know that you can see me, but the important thing is that you can see the screen in front of you. Um, so I am here to talk about uh, competitions at NASA and, um, and, and how these are yet another tool in NASA's toolkit for, uh, for, um, for innovation. So, so you've heard a bit about how uh, a number of um, more traditional ways that we run uh, and pursue innovation at NASA. Of course, we, we do the work ourselves with our very talented science and engineering workforce in many cases. And then we also, um, we have opportunities uh, for the outside community to participate by way of um, contract, excuse, yeah, contracts as well as grant opportunities opportunities, uh, cooperative agreements, those sorts of things. So prizes and challenges, another tool in our toolkit, um, which really bring a, a unique set of strengths to, to, the, to what we're trying to do. Um, in, in one case, it is about, um, it is that we are focused on uh, solutions and delivering uh, solutions to the agency. Not that grants and contracts aren't either, because they are. But what I mean by that is just the approach that we take. Uh, where you have a grant or a contract, you are essentially, um, uh, you know, you, you make a proposal to, to the agency in a certain topical area. The agency then uh, reviews that, you know, convenes a panel to review the, the, uh, the, the um, proposals. And then essentially those reviewers are making a decision on what the most meritorious, what the most promising research or proposals are. And then awards are made in the hopes that, you know, in fact, the, the, um, the agency, the government will, will, will yield that return that has been proposed. With prizes and challenges, we're really turning that work on its head. And we are starting with a problem statement and we're asking folks to go off and do the work to solve a specific problem, whether it be improving a piece of software or developing an algorithm um, that will help um, make a process more efficient, developing a hardware prototype. Uh, you go out and do it, and then you are awarded based on your ability to fulfill the problem statement. So we make awards for work done rather than work to be done. Um, what is also very interesting and unique about prizes and challenges is we are all about increasing the number and diversity of participants addressing a problem. Now, of course, we're all about diversity and, and inclusion across the agency. What I mean here is that we um, really value getting new points of view into, into the agency and prizes and challenges really thrive on that. The ability to, to, to know that there's, uh, there are so many types of expertise out there that we can draw on and, and prizes and challenges can attract that. And we do that because we, we reach out to, to communities beyond, I mean, including the space science and engineering communities. But in addition, we try to reach out by way of social media and, and targeting of specific areas of expertise that may not be the ones that NASA uh, typically relies on. Next slide, please. So we at NASA have run hundreds of challenges to date. Um, we have solved problems across the agency. Uh, so we have we have had uh, we have run competitions in aeronautics, space and earth sciences, human spaceflight, cross-cutting space technology, uh, for multiple uh, multiple purposes. Some of these can be about developing ideas, just figuring out some ideas to get research moving in, in uh, technology development in particular directions. So they can be engineering design challenges or concept development challenges. We've run uh, competitions where, again, we're looking for an operational solution for a particular program. It could be a you know, software improvement, an algorithm, a development of an app or a visualization. Uh, and then again, we have state of the art advances um, where we or that we're seeking by way of a hardware prototype development challenge. And that could be something rather small or something rather considerable, like what we did with the, um, 
3D printed habitat challenge. You can see the picture there in the upper left hand corner where we where um, uh, competitors brought their equipment in to, to develop these uh, additively manufactured um, uh, habitats, uh, third scale, one third scale habitats uh, for, for lunar or Martian living. Um, our competitions are open to individuals as well as teams, um, and they are open, um, all of them are open to U.S. Uh, citizens and entities, and some of them are open to non-U.S. participation as well. I encourage you, if you are coming from outside of the United States or are a non-U.S. citizen, please read the read the instructions. We are um, governed by particular pieces of legislation that determine um, which of our competitions we're able to offer uh, prize awards to outside comp competitors or not. Um, our competitions vary across NASA as far as what those awards look like. Sometimes we're talking about a non-cash award, like in the case of a student challenge, those tend to be things like internships or experiences with NASA. But then we offer cash awards um, depending on the complexity of the, the problem we're looking to solve. Could be uh, an award of just a few hundred dollars up to something that's um, millions of dollars in prize per and partnerships are really key to what we do. We cannot do the work that we do for many of our challenges that are um, very um, labor intensive, resource intensive, um, and expertise intensive without uh, working with other organizations, both for profit and nonprofit outside of the agency. Next slide, please. So um, we are we have run a number of different competitions um, in the lunar uh, world um, uh, to uh, in the past year. Um, I'm looking. I'm realizing that the slides I'm looking at were actually the slides that I um, that I ran in the fall. So I'm not. I'm, I'm, um, but I know what's on my new slides, and 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 I can tell you that um, we have run. We have completed. Um, or are actively reviewing the, um, the Apollo Moon Pod essay contest, as well as the Big Idea Challenge. Those are two student-focused challenges. So those are wrapping up and, and um, being judged at the time. Uh, we currently are running the, or, or we're, we're wrapping up actually and going to be announcing phase one of Watts on the Moon Challenge. The, um, um, those awards will be uh, um, announced in the next couple of weeks. That's our uh, competition that's focused on uh, lunar, uh, storing power and, and distributing power on the lunar surface. Please be on the lookout if you're interested to participate in phase two of that competition, which we expect to release this fall. And then the, we have the Break the Ice competition, which you can still register for and compete uh, in phase one of that competition through June 18th. That's focused on uh, excavation of the lunar uh, icy regolith and uh, delivery of water. Uh, the first phase being an, uh, an engineering design, which will then go on to a, a hardware build um, in the second phase. So uh, last slide, please. So again, please come participate with us. Um, you can find all of the competitions that we are currently that are currently open for participation on our website, uh, nasa.gov slash solve. You can find us on Twitter as well. Please come if you're interested in competing with us, if you're interested in being a judge, we always need qualified judges for our competition. So if uh, you are, if, if you're interested, we will work to match you up um, with an area that can benefit from your expertise. And then again, we, um, uh, thrive on uh, working with other partners from other organizations. Um, so if you have some, if your organization uh, is interested, please talk to us and we uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Jason Kessler, um, and he is currently leading the NASA Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Programs. Uh, he's also served previously as the Deputy Director for Server, which is a partnership with regional organizations to provide worldwide help for developing countries uh, to use information provided by Earth-observing satellites. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Kessler. Thanks so much. I think y'all have my first slide. Super. Uh, hello, everybody. So great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about the opportunities with the SBIR and STTR programs to engage the best and brightest small businesses and research institutions. Uh, next slide, please.
our next slide will show our mission and vision. Um, we're really working to uh, further the relevant research and, uh, and build capabilities for NASA, commercial aerospace industry, and, and ultimately the nation as a whole. So the SVIR and STTR programs are uh, congressionally mandated through the SBA. Uh, and we focus on engaging small businesses, that's companies with less than 500 employees, um, with uh, funding to enable them to develop technology for needs that we've expressed uh, and that can help the commercial marketplace. Uh, and while we uh, as a program fall within the Space Technology Mission Director, we also serve the entire agency. Uh, so we're tied to everything that NASA does. Next slide, please. So we, we look to uh, find ideas when and where they're needed. We work closely with the mission directorates across the agency to understand where the technology gaps and challenges are, uh, put out a solicitation uh, seeking solutions from small businesses across the country, uh, all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and that is happening throughout the year. Next slide, I'll show you the uh, phases. You, similar to NIAC, we have a three phase um, program. We really think about phase one as being the idea phase, testing feasibility. You can see the, the money there, uh, six months for, for SBIR and 13 uh, for STTR. Uh, Successful phase ones can then be part of a phase two selection process. Longer period of time, we're developing prototypes here uh, and a good bit more money. Uh, the ultimate goal being uh, getting to phase three where the small business solution is um, selling in the marketplace. Now clearly getting to phase three uh, Y'all probably are familiar with the Valley of Death. It can be quite challenging. And so we've done a number of things to try to help the small businesses be more successful in that transition. We have an i program that helps the small businesses look to the market, do, out, do interviews of potential customers, really understand what pain points are. Um, beyond that, we have several phase two vehicles uh, and probably most relevant for this audience, the, the Lunar Sequential uh, Awards uh, falls within our, our sequential activity. Uh, and last summer, you may have seen the $29 million that was uh, awarded uh, through that uh, effort. We're currently in the process of selecting a next round of uh, Lunar Sequentials and hope to be able to share that later this summer. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that I am particularly excited about um, the SBIR and STTR programs, SBA has a goal for us to foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by women and socially or economically disadvantaged persons. And so as we're engaging with small businesses, we do a, a very concerted effort to um, reach out to communities that we don't typically engage with. Um, we work really hard to, to do that. And you can see some of the numbers there. Um, pool awardees this year, 27% of the companies uh, from our phase one uh, selections were from underrepresented groups, including minorities and uh, women owned businesses. Uh, and then for our STTR program, 19% of the research institutions uh, that uh, are partners in that effort um, are from minority serving institutions. So pretty good numbers, um, but clearly we have more to do and, and we have a number of activities that I won't go into detail right now, but I'd be happy to, to engage um, with uh, in the question and answer period. Um, next slide, please. So, Probably a good place to start is with our focus areas. You can see them here. We have the uh, top, the, the, the focus areas that are probably most relevant to you all uh, highlighted in orange. These are areas of, of lunar application. 
Um, so I would suggest if you are interested, you could begin at that website, that link, sbir.nasa.gov slash solicitation. Um, and you can get more information about the focus areas. Um, and you can see there are many uh, focused on, on the moon. And then my final slide, please. Here you have contact information. Um, we have uh, a number of folks uh, throughout the uh, country. Uh, you can find contacts at that link um, or you can call our help desk uh, at that number as well. So with that, I will hand back to you all and look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Uh, at this time, we'll circle back and see if we can uh, get Dr. Marion Griffith and his slides. So, Dr. Griffith, can you unmute? Can you hear me? We're getting feedback, so you must have two mics open. Okay, I think I can hear you now on my laptop, but I couldn't get through uh, to be able to speak on the phone. So I'll, I'll try to handle this uh, over the, the, the usual system. Yeah, we can hear you fine. And okay. Your slides, I believe, are up. They are. Thanks, and sorry for the technical difficulties. So I think I was in the, the midst of explaining that uh, uh, STRG, Space Tech, Space Tech Research Grants, uh, isn't just Luster. In fact, Luster is very new with the inaugural solicitation last year. Uh, we have five uh, releases, which are all appendices uh, to Space Tech Ready. Um, and the, the overall aim of, of, of all of these is to engage uh, US academic institutions at the full range. Uh, so from graduate students to early career faculty. So for the early career faculty solicitation, uh, the goal there is to support um, someone that is uh, an assistant professor uh, and 100% of the, the award goes to that person so that we can help them uh, develop their career and help them contribute uh, back to NASA. Uh, ESI is, is somewhat similar uh, to ECF in, in the low TRL uh, entry and the sort of high risk, high reward uh, nature of it. Uh, but in that case, uh, partnerships uh, with other universities um, and, uh, and, and co-eyes uh, in other organizations are, uh, are permitted. Uh, I won't talk about Luster too much now because we have a slide uh, on that. Um, and then the final uh, solicitation that we release as an appendix to Space Tech Ready is uh, uh, STRI, Space Tech Research Institutes. So early career faculty uh, is worth around about 600,000 um, total over three years. Early stage innovation is 650,000 over three years. Um, I'll talk about Luster later, and Space Tech Research Institutes is $15 million across five years. Uh, and what's interesting about Space Tech Research Interest Institutes is that they are they have to be multi-institution, multidisciplinary uh, teams. So although probably the solicitation of most interest to, to this group um, is Luster, um, please note that you won't, uh, you, well, you will see um, lunar-centric uh, topic solicitations uh, in our other appendices. Uh, for instance, we just uh, released one under ESI 21, which was uh, to do with uh, power management and distribution on the moon. So you don't just have to look at Luster for, for lunar-centric uh, solicitations coming out of SDRG. Uh, please feel free to, to look elsewhere. Let's go to the, the next slide. And this just gives you a, a, it's a real, real quick slide, just the basic idea of uh, the diversity of, of where we invest and, and across the taxonomy uh, space. Uh, we haven't hit all of the states uh, as yet, um, but we have hit most of them, uh, and we look uh, to increase uh, diversity as we as we increase as we go through uh, more of these processes. Uh, to date, we've made around about 796 awards. Uh, I won't. Uh, say that that is the exact right number because it's ever increasing. We're, we're making awards very frequently. Uh, and at any one particular time, uh, we have 300 plus uh, active awards uh, in place all over uh, the US. Okay, next slide. So this is the one that people might be uh, most interested in. Uh, so Luster was first released uh, in 2020, so last year. 
and under the umbrella of, of LSII. Um, so a couple of things that are, that are different about Luster than the other solicitations. One is our incoming TRL. Um, for all the other solicitations that STRG releases, uh, our expected incoming TRLs are one or two. For Luster, our incoming TRLs are two to four. Um, so getting up towards that mid TRL um, level. Uh, it's written there two to five. That's because we would expect that if someone comes in at, at four, uh, they would make meaningful advancement uh, on the TRL scale during the course of their two year uh, award and, and may reach five. Uh, the other thing that's unique um, about Luster is that we explicitly solicit ideas um, from LSII. Um, we only feature topics uh, that fall under their six uh, focus areas, which map to the focus groups of, of LSIC. Um, so we're tightly coupled there. Um, we work with Nikki's team to make sure that the, the solicitation we release uh, and the topics that we feature are of high priority um, to LSII. Um, in terms of general facts, so the maximum duration uh, of a Luster Award is two years. The maximum total funding um, is $2 million. So you can get, let's say, for instance, on average, up to uh, $1 million per year. Uh, our award instruments is grants uh, and not contracts. We have a couple of links in here um, that if, if these slides are shared after the meeting, uh, you can click on them uh, to see what was recently selected. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, and take a look at the, the latest uh, solicitation that was released last year. Um, I will say that we do anticipate uh, releasing Luster again this year. Uh, the exact uh, time, and, time and date is TDD, um, but mid-year uh, is the expectation. On eligibility, um, as with all uh, SDRG solicitations, because um, that's our job, um, the, organizing, uh, the organization submitting proposal must be an accredited US university. Um, the PI must be a professor at a submitting university. Um, we have co-eyes uh, are obviously per permitted here. At least 60% of your total budget of the award must go to accredited US university. So that doesn't mean it has to go all to the PI's university, but if there are multiple universities partnering, at least 60% of the total budget must go to US university. And that means that up to 40% uh, of the budget can go to uh, other teams, um, so industry, nonprofits, uh, and those um, those partnerships are encouraged, uh, I think, because of the the nature of, of LSII and the fact that we fall under uh, that LSII uh, umbrella. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I briefly uh, wanted to mention and congratulate uh, our inaugural um, awardees. Uh, for Luster 20, um, we featured six topics under two LSII focus areas. So we chose uh, ISRU and sustainable power. We had six topics within those and we made six awards. Um, and those have gone to the various places that you see uh, on the screen. So congratulations to Asan Chowdhury, Paul Van Susanti, Alien Wang, Phil Lubin, Art Wotelski, and Jim Wang. Um, we received some excellent uh, proposals, a very strong response, uh, and I think the, the selecting committee was given a, a very good subset with which uh, to make some decisions, and we're, we're excited about the, the selections we made, and we think they hopefully will feed back uh, into this community uh, with very positive results, and also make use of this community to, to strengthen their own research as they make their way through the next two years. Okay, that's all I had to say on SDRG and Luster. Thank you, Dr. Griffith. Um, I would like to remind everybody that you can put uh, questions in the uh, Q&A panel. Uh, while to give everybody an opportunity to do that, I'm going to pose a uh, starting question, um, and people can feel free to, to respond. Um, one of the questions that I have for anybody on the panel would like to answer is, do your opportunities lean towards making awards for technologies that are more evolutionary or more revolutionary? So I'm, I'm happy to start. This is Gareth again. Um, so SDRG in, in all our solicitations lean much more heavily towards revolutionary than evolutionary. Uh, even with Luster being at you know the low to mid TRL uh, range, we're still looking for those revolutionary uh, concepts. That's across the board for us. 
And for Nyack, we specifically rule out anything that is evolutionary. So if you propose to us the next step, you will be considered as out of scope for the program. Uh, we are looking for not the next step in the roadmap, but something that breaks the roadmap itself. So hopefully there's lots of folks that can, that can think that way. Yeah, for, for our tipping point and ACO, of course, uh, we don't look at it as either uh, revolutionary or evolutionary. I think we are more focused on getting to the commercial capability. That's, that's really what we focus on. And I think for prizes and challenges, it's really a combination. Um, in some cases, we are looking for the revolutionary, where we are looking for that advance in uh, the and and state pushing the state of the art in a technology, um, seeing what's possible. But then in other places, we're really looking for something that just that fits a requirement because it's we're looking for an operational solution. So it need not be revolutionary, but it just needs to meet the requirement. And I'd say that we bridge. Uh, we bridge both as well. We received something like 1,700 proposals in for this last phase one. Um, we work to mature technologies, certainly, uh, when there's a, a solution understood, but absolutely welcome revolutionary ideas. Okay, thank you for, for those answers. Um, the next question I have is, what is one piece of advice you would like to pass along to proposers trying to write a winning proposal for your opportunity? I can go first. Okay. Uh, one thing I would like to tell all the proposers is uh, start early. Uh, don't wait till the last minute because uh, the system that they need to use to turn in the proposal is somewhat uh, complicated. And if you wait till the last minute to turn it in, I think uh, you may be disappointed because you put in a lot of effort, uh, but it'll go to waste. Before. Anyway, uh, that's, that's my biggest advice. The second thing I just, I do want to add, add to that is uh, uh, since our focus is uh, minimum TRL4, you want to make sure that when you write a proposal, make sure that you can substantiate the technology readiness level of your uh, technology, basically whatever you have developed. And uh, I think instead of showing us graphics, please make sure you can actually show us some hardware if you're really talking about uh, uh, testing something uh, going forward. Anyway, that's much my advice. For NIAC, the mission concept is really key. You can imagine that uh, a new fission or fusion even in space propulsion system would be really an amazing system. It could provide a lot of uh, uh, propulsive power, but you can also imagine that it might require so much cooling that the radiators make the spacecraft so heavy that in fact you do no better than uh, current chemical propulsion. Uh, that sort of quick analysis to show that what you're doing is potentially feasible is really important for our program. So that mission context helps us a lot. And for, for Luster, um, I, I would say a, a piece of advice, and, and this isn't specific to Luster or, or SDRG, um, but it's to put yourself in the reviewer's shoes. Um, Luster as an appendix um, being released is, is incredibly specifically written. Um, we know it's hard and, and not the most interesting thing to read. It's not, you know, solicitations aren't great bedtime reading. Um, but there is a lot of uh, very detailed, specific information and, uh, and, and requirements for what you should include in your proposals. Um, and all of those are going to be taken into account by the reviewers. So A, try to read the, the appendix, the, the solicitation as, as closely as possible. And then B, um, Put yourself in, in, in the reviewer's shoes and try and make it as easy as possible for them to find out how you've hit that, that requirement. Uh, don't make it hard for us to tease out how, how you've met something. Uh, I think uh, making things as, as clear as possible would be uh, one piece of advice. Uh, the other piece of advice that I would give um, is to remember with Luster, we, we have three evaluation criteria um, and they're all equally weighted. Um, so 
there is one, the, the third one typically, uh, that tends not to get as much uh, attention as the others. But when you're writing proposals, um, you know, for Lustre specifically, uh, please remember that your, you know, the management uh, section, how you're going to manage it, how you're going to staff it, what your data management plan looks like, uh, is equally as, a, is as important as the technical merit and your, your technical approach to the project. Those would be my two pieces of, of advice. And I fear my VPN kicked me out while the question was being asked, so. The, the question was, what piece of advice would you pass along to proposers trying to write a winning proposal for your opportunity? I don't want to step on Amy. I think you were about to speak. Um, sure, no problem, Jason. So I um, it was going to just suggest that um, for prize competitions, as I mentioned, we do encourage teams to participate. So um, really think about who, you know, what kinds of complementary right. um, expertises can be, uh, can contribute to a solution because so many times we see for our competitions, uh, when you have a, a conglomeration of different types of expertise on a team, that's where you really see the magic happen in a solution. And so I encourage you to think very broadly when you see a, um, one of our prize uh, competitions open to think about what kinds of expertise do you need to, to um, provide that winning solution. Uh, and I can add now, um, we have a really big solicitation. It's full of stuff and rules. Um, and so I would recommend taking your time with it. Um, there are a lot of requirements. Uh, we cover a lot of different topic areas. We have a large team, uh, folks at each center. So if you are live near a NASA center or whatever NASA center you're close to, you can reach out to our community and, and ask questions. Um, I would look at past, past winners. Um, the more you can educate yourself on our process, um, I think the better off you're going to be because it, it is set by SBA policy. And so we have kind of strict guidelines that we operate with. And so that you're most familiar with the process, I think then you'll be um, better set up to submit um, a competitive and, and ultimately hopefully winning proposal. Um, so use our, use our team, use the website resources and get familiar, uh, with the process is probably the, the, the three things I'd, I'd suggest for SBIR and STTR. Okay. Thank you for your answers. Uh, I'd like to ask one last question, uh, before we wrap up for the day. And that is what is the biggest error or pitfall you see when people propose to your opportunities? I guess the, the biggest pitfall is always uh, uh, not looking at uh, what we have asked for. I mean, like uh, that's being responsive to the solicitation. I think that has been uh, the biggest issue as I was talking about earlier. When we say uh, we require a minimum TRN of four and that almost becomes like a gate, meaning like either you are there or you're not there. If you're not able to substantiate what you have uh, actually uh, developed so far, then you are essentially not going to actually go through the second step, okay? That's the reason why we, want, we always say, please, please read the solicitation and also like the evaluation criteria. Uh, I think they are they're very important. I mean, uh, basically each reviewer, what they have to do is what, what, what's the criterion and what, what do they have in the proposal? So that's how we, we just compare uh, each one at a time and then we discuss at the end and then come up with the uh, recommendation or findings. So it is very important to look at the evaluation criteria. I have to agree with- I would say with... for- please. Oh, go ahead, Jason. After you, please. 
Okay, no problem. Um, I would say for prizes and challenges, oftentimes we'll have a registration date and then we'll have a submission close date. So I really encourage you to look very carefully at those dates because the registration will often close before submissions are due and that you have to get in with the, the registration before you're able to submit. So please pay close attention to those close of registration dates. And I would agree with LK on that evaluation criteria that we work quite a long time uh, to, to make sure that those are as clear as they can be. Of course, conveying information in words, sometimes it goes wrong, but uh, you can take a look at those eval criteria and then look at past awards as well to try and suss out what those eval criteria are trying to say. NIAC is a little unique in that we're uh, looking for something so, so specific that we actually include a list of things that we specifically do not want. And we eliminate about 70% of respondents because they fall into one of those 10 categories. So taking a look at the solicitation is a good thing to do almost every day when you sit down at your computer to write uh, and re refresh yourself on what the evaluation criteria are. And if there's a do not want list or anything like that, you can take a look at that too and try and, and figure that out and use those as uh, the guide to what we're looking for because we try really hard to make them clear. And for, for SDRG, I would, I would echo what's been said before, uh, which essentially it comes down to being very careful about reading uh, the solicitation requirements and, and what's uh, being requested. There are a few things that are uh, potentially somewhat unique uh, to SDRG. Uh, so some that I, I wrote down, um, just in case anyone was taking notes. So we, we have um, a, a set of people that can contribute to a proposal called a collaborator. Uh, and a collaborator is very specifically an unpaid contributor to a project. Um, whether collaborator is the, is the best choice of, of word or, uh, or not, um, it is frequently misunderstood uh, and frequently leads to confusion during reviews or, or people's proposals not being selected because uh, of a misinterpretation of, of that word. Um, so please, when you read our solicitations, um, understand uh, what a collaborator is and what they are not. Um, another frequent thing that we see is people uh, going over page limits. Uh, for us, if, if people submit uh, proposals with sections that are too long, we will, we will cut uh, anything beyond the page limits that were set out in the appendix. Uh, and then the other thing to understand and make sure you're careful on uh, is the role and eligibility of, of other government agencies, FFRDCs, uh, industry nonprofits, NASA and JPL, uh, and what they can do and what they cannot do. Uh, so for instance, for us, NASA and JPL uh, cannot be involved at all. Um, you can have uh, OGA collaborators um, Industry and nonprofits are certainly encouraged to be partners uh, on your proposals, but please read that section on, on eligibility and understand who can be funded, who cannot, and who, you know, in a proposal to SDRG, we don't want to see anyone from NASA or JPL um, on that uh, proposal at all. And that's another thing that we do see frequently, um, and that only serves to hurt you as, as the proposer to, to SDRG. Um, I think that's it with the exception of uh, register for Enspires early. Uh, please don't leave, don't leave your registration uh, to Enspires to the last day. Uh, it does take time, it can be complicated, and things can go wrong. Uh, and it is your responsibility to submit within the timeline. So I, my advice would be to make sure that you uh, get into Enspires and start uploading the required documents uh, at least a couple of days ahead of time. And that's it from me. Yeah, I would just build on all of that. Um, doing your homework, knowing the solicitation, be prepared. We use an electronic handbook for the submission of, of proposals and reviews. And there, it shuts down when it says it's going to shut down. And it can take longer to upload than you anticipate. So be prepared. We're expecting to release the phase one solicitation in or, uh, first week of January that would run through first week in March. Uh, so spend this year getting smart about what we've done in the past um, and then be ready to go so you can maximize your, your time and preparation and responding to what's in the solicitation uh, so that you can submit in time and, and then be a part of the, the, the cohort that gets reviewed.
Okay, I would like to thank all the panelists for their time, and I will turn it over to Rachel to close up. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And yeah, I think it's funny. No matter where you go, it comes down to just read the, try not to say what we used to say in the 80s, but <laughs> RT darn manual <laughs> and, and really know what you're proposing to. So, that's, so thank you to um, our speakers all for, throughout the whole day. This has been really great. Um, I appreciate everybody and all of our attendees for your time. Um, tomorrow we're going to reconvene. We'll have 1030. We'll have Gather Town open again. Um, for folks that want to come in and have coffee and chat and network. Um, and we're beginning the day at 11. What we're going to start with um, tomorrow is another panel discussion. And this time we're bringing in folks from um, other institutions as well to start talking about this ecosystem towards the end of the decade where we have other players, including potentially DARPA, um, and uh, involved in this lunar potential future lunar economy. Um, and then we'll have talks from the community um, throughout midday. And then um, we will hear from some of the awardees to these programs. So you'll be able to, under, to hear a little bit more about some of the projects that have been funded um, for the programs that you've just heard about, um, just to get a better idea of the breadth of, um, of projects and the scope of the projects that are available. And then finally, we'll have breakout sessions tomorrow. So. Thanks again to everyone, and um, have a lovely evening or afternoon, wherever you are, maybe middle of the night. Thank you. We're done.